All right, everyone, welcome to the webinar today. Um, this is Jonathan Dane. I'm the CEO over here at Kleinboost. I just want to wait a few minutes to make sure that everybody gets in um, and can be with us from the start. Uh, any, any, you guys have questions or concerns with the audio? Let me know in the questions side. Um, want to make sure it's crystal clear before we get started. It should be, but uh, uh, never. But perfect. Let's hang on a few more minutes. Also, we'll be we'll be doing Q and A at the end, but feel free to drop some questions and comments in in the chat box. I see Jonathan just jumped on in there. All right, super, super cool. Thanks for saying that, Casey. Um, so today we're gonna go over some um, unused e-commerce acquisition and fulfillment tactics. On our own side here at Client Boost, we have Reese, our director of e-com, uh, be introduced here shortly, and also Casey Armstrong, who is the CMO of ShipBob. As we're going through this webinar, uh, we're gonna keep it very conversational. So there's gonna be slides on both the acquisition and the fulfillment at the same time. Um, and as we go along, think of the questions you guys might have if anything wasn't clear. So to give you guys a little bit of insight, um, Client Boost is both a, a agency from a PBC and CRO standpoint. So we help e-commerce clients um, across the globe, um, basically increase their, their ROAS, uh, lower their cost per sale, increase their volume from a scaling perspective and also help them um, increase their conversion rates. Um, we also have a software coming out, which is gonna be called Kite, um, which does a lot of the uh, the auditing and the uh, the automation for us too. Um, ShipUp, which is on uh, Casey's side, is an end-to-end e-commerce fulfillment solution. And uh, check out their website too. And I'm sure you're gonna get learn a lot from the, from the slides that we're gonna cover um, as well. So the speakers today, are gonna be Reese and Casey. And I'm gonna pass the mic off to Reese as he joins and uh, can start talking about some of the things that we do for our clients. Go ahead, Reese. All right, hey everyone. So right now, we're gonna kick off by starting with some of the must-haves for Google Ads. So um, if you run any shopping campaigns at all, you know that Google Shopping starts with your product data. If you don't have any product data, you can't serve ads. So we don't have time to cover all the specifics that go into your product feed, but we should talk about one of the most important ones, which is your product title. So if you don't have uh, you know, if you don't have an accurate product title, in some cases that can make as much as a 10x difference in your traffic. You can think of the title as basically the shopping equivalent of the keyword that you're targeting. So it's important to get it right. So here we're looking at a couple of examples. Um, you can see that uh, Bonobos and Cashmere Heart, uh, they're offering free shipping, um, pretty cool offer that can help you stand out. Um, one that I also want to point out is Link Soul. Um, that's kind of toward the end there. So Cashmere Fool Zip Sweater, that's fine. It gets right to the point. But if you're just, you know, if you, someone just told you it's a cashmere fool's zip sweater, you might have a ton of questions like, what color is it? What size is it? Is it men's or women's? Who makes it? Um, we're going to talk about a counter example a little bit after this. Um, but first, I want to let Casey interject too, in case he wants to uh, address anything on the shipping side. Sorry, I was uh, I didn't realize I was muted. If you want to go up a slide really quickly, yeah. Uh, oh, sorry, back. back. And back one more. So, back some, one so more. Some, yeah, back one more where your bullet points are. So, so, so something oh. I call out here is is analyzing. Uh, no, yeah, here we go. Analyzing your competitor pricing and you know things such as your shipping. Uh, so when I was when I was running, uh, helping run a company called Watchmaster, something we kept a very close eye on was how can we offer pricing differentiation? And because we were uploading, 
we were really maxing out the Google Shopping API and, and uploading and changing pricing across multiple regions uh, multiple times a day and at least once a day. And we, we built this, this pricing calculator that would look at uh, the purchase price that we paid for, for certain items, uh, the margins that we had set at a minimum, what our total COGS were, and then we would we'd often try to undercut when we could our competitor pricing between one to five dollars. And so uh, that's something that really helped us stand out from Google Shopping, is especially as it gets more and more competitive, is, is how can you try to build some more automated way to differentiate? And then another thing is shipping too. So whether you're doing PPC or, or SEO or anything else, sometimes the, the best tool is honestly just Googling it. What, what are some of your best sellers? and get out there and, and search for those. And uh, and then Reese, if you want to go to the next slide, please. Um, as is as is highlighted on, on here, you know, you can see free shipping. And so that's not something that everybody offers. Obviously the two on the left, they have um, they have the schema to show the uh, to show the ratings. There's only there's only two that offer free shipping. There are a few that have the price drop, which uh, is also not always the best thing because it, you know, for a cashmere schedule, sweater that kind of signals more luxury. And so uh, the price drop is not always the best thing, but again, you don't know it until you try it. Um, and I guess uh, the one on the far right, again, Bonobos offers free shipping, but that's just something to, you know, really take into consideration. And, and you don't really know what the, your competitors are offering until, until you get out there and search. And then if you want to go to the next slide, please. Uh, I wanted to call out something that that a customer of ours is doing, and and they're doing quite well. Uh, you know, the CEO at I Love Plum was sharing some information the other day, and just by by offering the free day free two day shipping, um, without harming margins, not only did did they see an increase in their conversion rates, but through the confidence that they're exuding in that Amazon type experience to their customers. Um, they were actually able to almost two x their AOV, and so I'm sure you know Reese and, and all of you can dive into this and, and explain even more. But just as we think through, as as channels become more and more saturated, and and the cost per click and the CPA continue to rise, uh, anything you can do to, of course, get repeat visitors, but even before that, increase that AOV is is huge. So I wanted to make sure I, we called that out. Yeah, that's an that's an awesome example, Casey. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, offering two day shipping to double the AOV, that's, you know, it's hard to not call it a good play. Um, one, uh, I kind of want to go back to this one really quick. So just to kind of like bring this cashmere full zip sweater example back, um, I kind of want to show the good counter example to this now. So by contrast, we can see this Everlane one right here in the center, men's cashmere V-neck sweater by Everlane in Heather Gray, size medium. Um, you know, if you hear that, you can basically almost picture that sweater without even having to really see a picture of it. And so that's kind of what I define as like the litmus test for a good product title. Because again, um, you know, when it comes to just acquiring the right visitor in the first place before you can even get to doubling your average order value, um, hugely important to be very descriptive in your product title. Um, almost think of it like from an accessibility perspective. Make sure that if someone just hears the words, they can picture your actual product. And that's going to make sure that you're in a really good spot to get the best traffic for the items that you're selling. So um, kind of like along that note too, um, in the link sole example, they didn't even mention their brand name in the product title. You can see that Everlane includes theirs here kind of in the middle. And so between, and you can even see on the first one, Brooks Brothers, they have theirs right up front. So between these kinds of different examples, you might be wondering how to actually use your brand name in your product titles. And so I kind of came up with this matrix that gives us, um, I think, a really good rule for understanding how to use your brand name and product titles. And so um, what I define here as the sweet spot is if you have a preferred brand and basically it's your first party brand that you sell, like if you're J. Crew or Nike or Brooks Brothers, um, and there's a high search volume behind that, then definitely include your brand in your product titles. Um, the cases where I don't really recommend including it are if you're like a, a Best Buy or like some other kind of third party um, products in Dynex, uh, but there's not really like a Best Buy brand TV. And so even if you do like a search for like Best Buy Samsung TVs, you'll see that there's 
Uh, Best Buy has no problem taking up all those shopping results, but focus on the product first. Um, if you're a third party seller, your own brand name could be a bit of a distraction. And if you're a new brand, if you're you know just getting started up, you started selling products a few weeks ago, and there's not as much search volume behind your name yet, uh, I would in recommend including your brand more toward the back of your product title so you can focus on getting traffic for the product searches first because uh, Google tends to read your product titles kind of like a person from left to right. And so um, you wouldn't want to take up too much of that priority by having a brand that people aren't as aware of yet at the very front. So um, I wish I could say that having good product data alone is enough. Um, if you've been running shopping ads for a while and you feel confident in the product titles that you do have set up and you feel like you know these are great people should know exactly what these products are just by seeing them but you're still not seeing the returns then you might be falling victim to something that i call the mob effect so the mob effect is exactly what it sounds like you're spending a ton of money and getting almost nothing in return from a you know entity that you don't really have like any control or sway over um, a lot of times I see this when accounts come in and they have one ad group set up, all their products in that one ad group, and it's just that one campaign and that's it. And so in one case, I saw that four products out of 500 were taking up 51% of shopping spend and contributing only 8% of the revenue. Um, that's, that sucks. So I want to talk about a way that we've come up with to beat that. So um, I like to call it the gold pan technique. And I know I'm going kind of quickly. We've got a ton of content to cover. So I'm talking a little bit quickly, but we will be sending out the recording afterwards. So don't worry about keeping up if you're trying to take notes. Um, the mob effect is basically a system where we use multiple shopping campaigns as opposed to just one. And we use negative keywords as a sort of filter to kind of mine for the gold nuggets. And so um, I want to kind of show a diagram of what that looks like before I get too much into the explanation of it. But basically think of all the search terms that you could get for your shopping campaigns as kind of like this big flow, like represented by this cloud up at the very top. Because we can't target positive keywords in shopping like we do at search campaigns, we're pretty much entirely reliant on the traffic the feed gives us, which is why I was um, so, uh, so animated about product titles earlier. And so really, we kind of have to work backwards if we want to be intentional about the traffic that we get from shopping. And so um, we found that the best way to do that is by using a negative keyword list of your best search terms. So if you kind of fall into that brand sweet spot that we talked about a little bit earlier, um, these could be your brand terms. If you want to, like if you're Nike and you want to distinguish between people searching for uh, Nike running shoes as opposed to regular running shoes, um, that would be like this filter that you use right here. So you could imagine, you know, all your traffic comes to right here. If someone has Nike in their search term, um, it's blocked from this campaign because of the negative list. So then it goes down to this lower priority campaign um, where you can actually bid on the gold nuggets. Those Nike, those branded terms, whatever gets you your best performance. And the idea is that you bid lower in this generic campaign to improve your ROAS here. And then you maximize traffic for those gold nuggets in this lower priority campaign here to maximize your revenue. Um, the thing that holds it all together, which is super important, is a shared budget. And so I know some people might ask, like, if we're doing this kind of multi-campaign setup, why wouldn't we just give a huge budget to the campaign that we want to capture all of our high ROI or high intent traffic? Um, I wish it were that simple, but think of it this way. If our high priority campaign ran out of budget, which it would first, since it's going to basically we're telling Google we want this campaign to run first. Um, if this campaign ran out of budget, where would all the other traffic go? It'd have to go somewhere and the medium or low priority high ROI campaign is the next best place where it would go. So having a shared budget, just make sure that your system of campaigns stays in all the same options together and that one doesn't run out of budget, kind of rendering your gold pan useless. And so. Um, it's definitely a strategy that um, we're really pumped on over here at Client Boost. Um, in some cases, we've seen as much as a 71% lift in revenue. You can even see in this analytics screenshot, the cost was actually down. So there was an improvement in return on ad spend there too. Um, and kind of a, a way that we've been pushing the system lately, a uh, question that's been on my mind, we can 
best performing search terms, but what about our best performing products? And so we've actually been splitting this out into kind of multiple mini gold pans where we have campaign, basically like gold pan structures just for um, most of our products, products that happen to be on sale. And then products that we have, we know to be our top sellers based on analytics and other data. Uh, we, you know, why wouldn't we want to make sure that our top selling products are being able to show for our best performing search terms. So splitting out into these extra campaign segments has been kind of like a no brainer for us and is something that I've been really excited as we've built it out over the last couple months. Perfect. And then uh, just as actually, sorry, if you just go back one quick sec to the prior slide. So uh, just as Reese was talking about with with splitting them out um, with things such as as free shipping, you might be incurring a cost there. So you need to take that into consideration when evaluating the ROI and performance of a campaign. And so, again, at Watchmaster and, and elsewhere, that's that's something that we employed quite often, which was, uh, again, using that. Um, to have a much better calculation. And, and so as I, I tried to keep up, you can go to the next slide if you want, please. Uh, I tried to keep up my, my gift game with the, uh, with the client boost crew here. So I called it the, the Veruca salt effect. So for, for those of you, and hopefully I'm not too much dating myself, the, the, the original Charlie and the chocolate factory, at least it's, it's, I want it now. And so if you go to the next slide, please, I mean, I think we, we all know, how how much that is happening today, and just the the expectations that you know companies like uh, Amazon have set, and now Target and Walmart and Nordstrom and so many the, these other billion dollar businesses, and you know that's of course where ShipBob we we come in and and uh, offer that solution for for these faster growing uh, e-commerce and direct to consumer brands, and just as uh, Francesca uh, Cavallo points out here she's the the founder of rebel girls which if you haven't checked that out she has just an, an awesome an awesome book series really empowering uh younger women um and you know they she actually launched through through kickstarter about three years ago um now they've sold 3.5 million books across uh i think over 77 countries so she, she knows a thing or two about growth and she just really nails it here where um for them to succeed uh, and really offer a, a more expensive and, and differentiated book. You know, people just need to have that confidence in that in that shortest time to delivery. And uh, especially during the holidays, you know, they just did not want to see people go elsewhere because they didn't offer that expedited or the, or that free shipping. And so again, sometimes you have an upfront cost from there, but can you can t make that back in your AOV or a reduction in cart abandonment? Um, and, uh, you know, not to belabor the point, but as I mentioned, it's, you still there, Casey? Let's see where Casey went. We're not sure. We're going to keep going until we get you back, Casey. Hopefully you didn't uh, get hurt. <laughs> Go ahead, Reese. Cool. Um, yeah, actually, I, I do kind of want to pick up a little bit of uh, where Casey left off. I actually really like that. He talked about um, the holidays uh, kind of coming up along those close shipping deadlines um, and fast shipping times. Um, Cause even myself, you know, it's, I'd be like, I, even I'm scrambling to like look for gifts that I can get like as late as like the 23rd or even 24th. Um, and so if you think about it, two day shipping or even faster shipping times, especially like leading up to the holidays, huge I'm, opportunity. I'm back, by the way. So, sorry about that. I don't, I don't know what happened. Sorry for interrupting you. Ooh, back, Casey. Cool. Um, yeah, I was just saying like how crucial I think it is to um, have those close, uh, those fast shipping times leading up to the holidays because as people kind of scramble to um, find more gifts for um, anyone, any retailer really who can kind of um, deadlines as close to the holidays as possible is going to have a huge chance to ramp up their acquisition. Uh, which is cool. That brings us to our third point. Um, new visitors convert way less than returning ones. And so if you've been running, um, you know, paid ads for any amount of time, this probably isn't a huge surprise to you and it shouldn't be, but 
there is stuff here that's I want to just remarket like everyone else does. Um, there are so many retailers out there who are basically just having their like one remarketing campaign set up, probably a display remarketing campaign that's targeting um, all visitors, and they leave it at that. And so um, it's definitely worth getting more granular than that. Um, at the very least, especially like with display remarketing, we want to be splitting our audiences up uh, where we're not just targeting all visitors, but really every visitor at each stage of the funnel is worth a different amount. Like, um, you know, someone who browses a few products is worth more than just a visitor. Someone who adds something to their cart is worth more than someone who be able to split audiences in a display marketing campaign at least into different ad groups um, and really bid on each of them uniquely because we want to distinguish between what their actual values are. Um, and I would say that's kind of just like the, the first building block of it. Um, the next step is I highly recommend taking all of your web remarketing audiences and customer lists across all campaigns um, and applying those. Uh, basically, Google has two remarketing settings right now which are targeting and observation and so if you add by observation basically just saying hey Google just um, basically notice that all these people on my remarking lists are here in addition to the keywords or whatever else I'm targeting and basically that, that allows you the opportunity to just collect data rather than having to actually create a separate campaign or set separate bids for people in your audiences and that's really cool because that gives you the opportunity to say okay let's collect some data for a bit and see how these audiences actually perform without making any major changes to my campaigns and then when you come back a couple weeks later evaluate the data then you can see where you really want to make your bid adjustments so if you see for example people who had an item to cart are twice as likely to convert, then that's a huge opportunity for you to say, oh, let's definitely increase our bids so we can be more aggressive with these people specifically as opposed to just every keyword. Um, and lastly, I kind of want to talk about um, breaking those out into their own standalone campaigns where you'd use Google's other remarketing setting, which is targeting. Um, and that's basically where you're only targeting people in your audience and whatever else, whatever other criteria you're targeting. Um, We've seen pretty awesome results with this with um, shopping RLSA campaigns. You can also uh, create a search RLSA campaign where you use only broad match keywords to help you broaden your reach a little bit and be more uh, aggressive about finding new search terms that you might not have realized yet that convert well. Um, I want to show this one example right here. Um, so with these kinds of audiences, it's not uncommon where because it's just people on your website, you're not going to have as much volume as you do elsewhere. But you can see in this case, the average ROAS for shopping is 4.97. But in our shopping RLSA, it's 7.61. Um, and so honestly, like who wouldn't want some of these incremental profits by just setting up this different structure? Um, and then before we get out of remarketing, I do want to talk a little bit more about um, kind of one bonus secret for Facebook dynamic product ads. Um, if you run Facebook remarketing, then more than likely you have one of these kinds of campaigns running. And so one thing that I think is super important for a lot of retailers to know is just because Facebook shows you these cool ad units that feature your products in there, that doesn't necessarily mean that if someone clicks on one of those, they're actually going to go to that product. So it's super misleading, but unless you actually um, apply this setting right here where it says deep link to website. Um, if you don't add in your product URL right here, um, it's not going to take you to the product. So basically the way that you get this, um, you would just type two left curly brackets and then product.url and then two right curly brackets to close it out. Otherwise, it's just going to take people to the default URL, which might be your home page or could be a collection page. Um, even if they click on an individual product. So definitely want to make sure you keep this little guy in there. And, and to jump in here real quick, Reese, I'm, I'm really glad you called this out because there have been quite a few times where uh, I've I've clicked on an ad like that, whether it be Facebook or Instagram, and you know you, you balance because it takes you to the home page or somewhere else. You can't even find what, what the ad was focused on. So it seems like <clears throat> such an easy thing to forget, but you know, so many people uh, ignore that. And, and another thing which I don't have highlighted here to think through as well, especially on mobile, which so much traffic on both Facebook and Instagram or on mobile, even Google Shopping, 
is is thinking through what you're using. Um, how easy is your is your checkout experience? And so, um, especially at my time at Big Commerce prior to ShipBob, and you know, a lot of the the leading platforms can offer this, but it's can you offer your your customers that one click buying experience, whether that's the PayPal one click checkout, uh, the Amazon checkout button that you can have in your on your site. Um, I know Apple Pay has that as well, and we saw across you know billions in uh, in GMV or in sales, just the conversion rates greatly increase when you when you allow that that one click opportunity, and it also just means people are often not having to get out of bed or or get up and and go get their wallet. So think through that as well. Gotcha. Yeah, I love that you mentioned the uh, the one touch buying because um, honestly, like you know across so many uh, Google Ads accounts, analytics accounts we've looked at, it's so common to see that, you know, mobile conversion rates are much lower than desktop. Um, and I would say, like, you know, Amazon's uh, one-click buy in their app is one of the few places where it feels like a totally frictionless way to convert on mobile. No anxiety, doesn't feel like any extra work at all. So I love that you mentioned that. Perfect. Then, yeah, if you want to skip two slides ahead, um, Especially when you just think through capturing people before they um, before they bounce, especially especially first time visitors. Um, but but the same goes for return visitors. Obviously, the conversion rate on return visitors is off the charts. They often they often pay more. They're obviously much less expensive to acquire since since you got them in the first time. Um, but it's just thinking through. Uh, the offers that you do promote and and it's not just thinking top of funnel but how do you think through the entire funnel and how do you provide that great experience and then how do you get that uh, top of mind and, and I know my calm blanket they did this over the holidays and and just really made sure they had this persistent nav bar across their entire website promoting the fact that they offered free two-day shipping and you know their product is not cheap and so it's uh, it, it's not often like a uh, what I'm looking for um, when you're like, checking out at a, at a grocery store, it's not just like an impulse buy. Uh, this is something that people would often maybe like consult their significant other or really think about. And so how can you get them to convert and, and not bounce? And, and I know by offering this, you know, two day and, and free shipping, they saw uh, an 18% reduction in cart abandonment, which again, anything you can do to help increase AOV or, or reduce abandonment to, uh, to improve your ROI is, is just such a no brainer. Yeah, and you know, one thing I want to mention alongside this too, um, you know, it's so important because, like, obviously, if you see an 18% reduction in cart abandonment, that's going to reflect in your in your you know Google Ads results, for example, um, and that wouldn't even be the result of necessarily a campaign or targeting change, um, but you'll likely see you know improved conversion rates, probably improved return on ad spend if all other things remain consistent, and you're reducing cart abandonments like that, and so. Um, yeah, I definitely want to take this as an opportunity to mention how important these things work hand in hand and how, you know, really just the ad itself, getting someone to the site, um, that can kind of fall short if, you know, we're not offering compelling things that actually make things easy for the customer. Cool. Um, and I also want to talk a little bit about our fourth uh, acquisition tactic which is using dynamic search ads as a catch-all for all your products. And so um, I love these because honestly, like if you, if you're, especially if you're a larger retailer, if you have, you know, 5,000, 10,000, upwards of 25,000 products in your catalog, then who, you know, who realistically wants to take out the time or, um, you know, put themselves in a monastery for like six months while they build out individual keywords for all those products. Um, you know, in, in a lot of ways, that's that's not necessary. It's not really the most efficient return on effort. And so um, in this case, having a dynamic search ads campaign can be a great catch-all for retailers with really large catalogs. Um, kind of like Google's organic results, dynamic search ads are powered by the content on your website. And so um, kind of to tie things back a little bit, this is another area where having very clear descriptive product titles uh, is a very, very important factor for your business since, you know, your DSA, your DSA campaigns, if you're running one, um, product titles would be a big thing that Google's looking at in order to bring the right searchers to your site. Um, basically, the uh, 
ultimate destination that a dynamic search ad brings someone to is going to be dynamic. And the headline will also be dynamic. It's based off of that content. So that's so important to get right. In these kinds of campaigns, um, depending on how your website is set up, I usually like like pages that coverage. And the great thing about these is that they don't, they're not really a permanent solution and we never really looked at them to be one. Um, but the idea here is to start with some lower bids since targeting can be pretty broad. And you wanna be aggressive about harvesting your dynamic search ads, search term data, and build your converters into new campaigns. So, you know, rather than going through this like crazy, huge, exhaustive effort to target keywords for every single product on the site, um, why not start with um, some top sellers or other high priority items first? Use a dy dynamic search ads campaign to help you discover the next best converters. And then really, you know, at that point, you're saving resources on not having to build so many things out and you're getting data on what next things that you should target. Um, kind of like a shopping RLSA campaign. The play here, you know, isn't really to blow volume out the water because we don't want to pay too much per clicks that we don't have as much control over. But again, in this case, um, if you if you go with the low bid route and kind of um, mine your search terms carefully, then DSA campaigns can be a source of good returns. Um, in this case, the ROAS from this DSA campaign is more than double the account average and not a huge amount of volume compared to the rest of the account. But again, who wouldn't want some of these incremental profits? And this kind of brings us to our second cool portion, uh, which is the must haves for Facebook. And so um, one thing that we're really huge about is being sure to work the full funnel on Facebook. and. I want to start this off by talking about something that might be like a, a little bit of a less conventional point of advice. And so um, I want to caution you here not to overspend on remarketing. And that might sound kind of odd if we're used to working in more of a Google Ads environment where, you know, let's maximize as much of our remarketing spend as possible um, just because, you know, if the, if the demand is there, let's fulfill it. So Facebook, on the other hand, is a little bit different. There is uh, basically like our uh, audiences aren't as linear as they might be on Google. Um, and that's because Facebook has to actually find people in the newsfeed. And so if we set a high budget for something, they're going to try and exhaust that budget, even if our audience is a little bit smaller. And so we wouldn't really want to have like a hundred dollar a day budget for a remarketing audience that has a thousand total people in it because they're gonna just get you know smacked in the face with seeing the same ad over and over again uh, we definitely don't want to do that to people who you know have a good chance of buying we don't want to um you know just overexpose those people but we do want to be smart about cross-selling to recent customers so um for example if someone buys a phone case from you um you definitely should show them ads for uh, like a screen protector. Um, cross sells or upsells like that, um, those plays definitely make a lot of sense. Um, and then do if you have a, a product like a lotion or some kind of skincare product where you want to replenish it on a regular basis, like every you know 45 days or so, if that's when your product runs out, um, definitely remarket at the right time for recurring orders too. Um, and kind of on the note of like making sure that we're not smothering our audiences, we don't want to smother our Facebook ad sets either. And so this is going to be another little piece of counterintuitive knowledge on Facebook stuff. Um, but because Facebook has so much data about people that we can target, it's so tempting to want to use every little bit of that data and target people who, you know, have a behavior for shopping and they have uh, an interest in one of our competitors and they're between the ages of 35 and 40 and they're female. And before you know it, after adding all these different layers of targeting, you know, maybe we have like 5,000, 10,000 people in our audience and we definitely don't want an audience that's going to be that small because, you know, after the week or so where you run that ad set, where do you scale from there? How do you find more people like those people that worked if that ad set did work out? So um, I kind of want to play devil's advocate and say that that actually doesn't work most of the time anyway. And so in this example, uh, we were actually um, 
running an initial campaign where we wanted to be intentional about the targeting. Um, there were uh, a couple of points of like uh, really specific interest data that the client was very interested in. And um, we weren't seeing really results that were um, in the ballpark that they were wanting to see. They wanted to see a below uh, $5 CPA in this case. And so um, we got on a call, we kind of realigned things and we talked about the advantages of running a broad ad set. And so this broad ad set is exactly how it sounds. Uh, we actually don't use any interest targeting in this case. Um, we do make a couple of adjustments just for target or languages we want to target, um, a couple of other basic details. Uh, but the idea is not to overload interest targeting. And uh, basically, the idea is to let the Facebook pixel harvest all the data that it's already taking about people making purchases on your site and let it ride free basically to kind of correlate those data points with all the huge amounts of data it has about all of its users. And so in this case, when we did that, we actually started seeing a 50% lower cost per acquisition than what we were seeing uh, originally. And so um, really the moral of the story there is sometimes it's best to just let your ad sets ride free if you're not seeing results with lots of very intentional targeting. Perfect. And, and then, and similar to, you know, to, to carry off the vein of uh, thinking full funnel and, and letting things ride free is uh, just to get back to some of the back office stuff. And, you know, so many people focus on top of funnel, which is, which is paramount. If you're not getting people much and, and the right people to your, to your website with uh, specified intent, then you have no business. But for the brands that really want to differentiate and win in, in 2019 and beyond and, and really the, the people who were separating from the pack over the last few years is uh, are those that were just thinking through that that full funnel and that full customer experience and and a big part of that too is is how can you hand off parts of your business to experts outside and and probably the the pricing and what they're providing is is similar or even cheaper than what you're doing today so you can focus on things that that you do best and and that you enjoy more such as focusing on marketing yes and you're definitely going to want that extra time because um, kind of the part two, especially if you're using broader ad sets, is you want to be sure to test your Facebook creative aggressively. Um, and so what I mean by this, I don't just mean having like, you know, five different image ads in one ad set, because um, I do say five creatives right here, but don't just do like, you know, like this image has a yellow background, this one has a blue background. That's really not going to give a lot of variation for Facebook to serve your ads with and honestly it's, it's just not very it's not very creative and it's not going to yield any re meaningful results to you like if you know like if someone does prefer the blue background over the yellow background what does that actually like what kind of meaningful um things that tell you about your customers it's just not very significant or actionable and so it really comes down to differentiating your content types and differentiating your ad types and that's really what's going to um, give you the most information about your customers and also give Facebook the most information on showing people the right people the right ad and so I love this diagram here um, one of the people that I work with Nick Cabello was really cool to be able to share this with me and so um, you can see here this is all one product it's all the same business it's all Theragun but all these ads look radically different and that's because they position them in such different ways. And so um, you can see here, influencer testimonial, um, NFL player David Johnson with Theragun, uh, this totally different user generated content, just a normal person. Um, PR, um, it looks like they're showing kind of like a Theragun demo on like a morning show. Um, and then a couple others to just show the product in use. And so, because each of these are so different, this actually gives you a huge opportunity to learn what kind of content does uh, your audience resonate the most with and which types of content are most useful at different stages of the funnel. So if no one's ever been to your site before, do they want to see um, you know, a PR look or an influencer? Uh, if someone has been to your site before, um, do they care more about um, getting a little bit of extra social proof with user-generated content, or do they just want to get down to the nuts and bolts of it and learn a little bit more about the product? So differentiating your content should definitely be a part of your Facebook ad strategy if it's not already. And uh, I love how you called that out because 
so many people and, and myself included will will often just keep testing a b testing a specific uh ad type and especially things like ugc which a lot of people ignore um if you're selling a, mm -hmm. a consumer product and to show what people are actually saying about it i love that idea yeah, especially because, I mean, there have been a couple of horror stories, not as many recently that I've heard, but um, I remember, I would say about a year or a year and a half ago, um, there was a, a big story that was like all over BuzzFeed about people that had been buying dresses from some retailer, um, a, a lot of times via Facebook ads, and they would like see this beautiful dress. Uh, and they open it up. You know, they realized that the the price that they paid, they realized why it was actually a, a cheap dress. It was they were pretty low cost, what I remember, um, but basically did not look like what they were supposed to be buying. But I think episodes of that, um, you know, might give people a little extra anxiety. So the more you can actually show, you know, real people with your product, I think is a huge value for new customers. And this plays into the ad types that you use too. Um, and in this case, don't just use different ad types for the sake of it being a different ad type. It's not really gonna be super useful to you if it's identical content just formatted differently. And so here, kind of really think about how each of these formats can give you an opportunity to um, you know, frame what you're telling a little bit differently or kind of make that content a bit richer. Um, one thing that I really want to point out too, um, sometimes people are, aren't as big a fan of this slideshow option. Um, and honestly, it, you know, if you're not a fan of it by default, I really want to encourage you to use it. Um, if you actually have data, you know, saying that it didn't work well for you, that's a different story. But, um, you know, if you have a few images that at least showcase your products looking good, try the slideshow out because Facebook serves it as a video. And in that case, you'll at least give yourself an opportunity to create a new type of remarketing audience where you can say like people who watched this slideshow video, let's remarket to them. And if you're looking for an extra foothold, that kind of gives you another layer to your funnel that you can work with. At the end of the day, you just definitely want to be sure you don't bore your audience. Um, I know I think some people are probably wondering, like, what about frequency? Um, is frequency an important metric to pay attention to? Um, personally, I really think it depends um, on the results you're seeing. So if you're seeing that your ROAS has been declining over weeks or like your cost per acquisition has been increasing over weeks, um, at that point, I would look to frequency as more of a diagnostic tool to see, you know, are, are these things happening because people are getting overexposed to my ads or they're getting bored? Um, and in that case, definitely look at frequency. But if you have a high frequency or what you define as a high frequency and your revenue keeps growing and your return on ad spend is still efficient, then don't worry about that as much just because what we really want to focus on is growing the business and growing profits. And, and great call on not boring your audience if, if you go to the next example. So I was fortunate to actually actually speak, spoke to Matt yesterday and uh, they were in a company called Backblade and uh, it's back shavers for men. It's, it's pretty funny. And so they launched a few years ago and uh, once they really started adopting this creative strategy and uh, showcasing what their product does in a more humorous way, they've just blown up. Um, they, they'll be a, an eight figure business this year. And as you can see here, just the, uh, I think this has what, 1.75 million views on, on this ad. And a lot of that honestly came organic. They, they got featured on Business Insider, their, their original video, um, which then ended up driving uh, between that and a handful of other things, um, like tens of millions of views. But here you can see it's, uh, it's, it's on brand for them and it showcases the product in a funny way. And, and this one, um, I think it's uh, his colleague actually shaving his back, which is so weird and gross and funny and odd and whatever other adjective you'd like to throw out there. Um, and they have another one where it's a, a man and a woman um, talking to a marriage counselor. And, and so again, it's, it's video and video, but one's more kind of user generated and the other one is more production. Whereas a, again, it's a, a husband and wife speaking to their therapist and, and talking about how you know their biggest problems in their marriages is hairy back and it, and it shows uh, this ape that looks kind of like this back blade logo in the bottom left. And again, it's you, you're, they're still selling the, the product but doing it in a humorous way. And any time you can do that where people just start sharing your ad organically, I know that there have been quite a few ads that I've come across that are just 
pretty funny or just way too crazy and you have to share it and just getting that lift, you know, that that's what it's all about. I know, I know Mizzen and Maine did something similar or, uh, late last year with Phil Mickelson, where he was just doing this like ridiculous dance, um, in their, in their ad. And fortunately that time when he was, had his shenanigans on the golf course where I think he picked up a putt. Um, so anyways, uh, you can't always time it like that, but just thinking through like, how can you do this in a more humorous way? I mean, you were inundated with ads and how can you add that element of storytelling and, um, and, and humor? Yeah, I love that. I mean, I, I totally agree. I think the storytelling aspect is huge because people are so much likelier to remember a story that they have an emotional response to. And so, I mean, if, especially if people haven't heard of you, just getting someone who you actually are on their way to buying something from you that's kind of half the battle because how, how are you gonna you know make sure to actually like check out their website look at their product if you can't even remember them five minutes later and that brings us to our seventh and last point um hacks to integrate your acquisition and fulfillment and so um i know you have a couple things coming up here casey so um i'm gonna pass the mic to you Perfect. Yeah. If you want to go to the next slide. Um, again, this is just thinking through, uh, I mean, I'm not going to lie, especially as somebody who uh, gravitates more towards the marketing and growth and sales side, the logistics and fulfillment and shipping, it's, it's, it's a pain. And it, it's often, you know, the quote unquote boring part of the business. And it's not something people want to think about, but it can really change your business. And so thinking about, you know, if, if you do use somebody like us or or another third party logistics platform to distribute your inventory and taking, you know, very important things into consideration, such as what is what is their footprint and how can you get the products to the customer as fast as possible? So as you can see here uh, with Steve, the CEO over at Brummel, uh, and he'd never launched, he'd never even ran an e-commerce store as of 15 months ago, and, and he sold tens of thousands of products. And since he sells these dress socks for men, unsurprisingly, he saw a huge percentage of his of his order volume coming from you know the financial capital of the U.S. and in New York, and so uh, all of his stuff was also fortunately in Chicago prior to that, which is another huge financial hub, and so he was he was able to get everything over to New York, which which not only reduced his uh, shipping costs but also improved the shipping time, which then of course improved NPS and repeat customers. And then, and then from there, you know, he was looking at it and he's like, okay, well, Los Angeles, San Francisco, a handful of other areas, how can I get closer to them and make it either cheaper for me, cheaper for my customers and improve the, um, improve the customer experience as well. And then if you go to the next map, and again, I won't, I won't, or the next uh, picture, which, uh, or slide that has a map, um, you know, I won't get into the, the nitty gritty of, of fulfillment and shipping here, but. Uh, this is just a good example, similar to what I touched on earlier, where um, the way that your shipping costs and time are calculated are based off of your shipping zone. And in the example on the left, this is if you're based in if you're based in LA and you're shipping everything out of LA, you can see when it gets starts to get to the dark orange and the dark red. That shows not just uh, an increase in time to delivery, but also an increase in costs. And when you're able to distribute your inventory in the example on the left, and in this example, it's San Francisco and, and Dallas and New York, uh, only in a couple pockets. It's really in um, the north of like North Dakota, where the population is pretty small. And, and then really the only place you're really impacted here would be Miami in the, uh, in the southeast. You're able to get everywhere pretty much between shipping zone five and below. And the, the amount that you'll spend on shipping and the time to get to the customer is just greatly reduced. And then also using this too, when you think of, or how am I gonna distribute the inventory? And then how am I gonna geo-target my ads? And so there is a, uh, a baby toy company that we were speaking to the other day and they have these little like plush sharks. And unsurprisingly, those sell much greater on the coast and they sell very few in middle America. And so they should distribute that accordingly. Whereas um, if they have uh, different products that um, that maybe skew towards certain pockets in, in Middle America, they can they can distribute that in, in Dallas or, or elsewhere. Awesome. Yeah, and I'll talk a little bit too, just a couple of tips on how you can kind of integrate your campaigns um, alongside that. So, um, you know, if you are, um, 
you know, whether you have, um, you know, just like one major fulfillment center or you have a few across a few different time zones, one thing that you can do on the campaign side to kind of help you um, steer away from higher costs if it's a further shipping zone um, or even in your copy to kind of promise faster shipping times, you can segment your campaigns by fulfillment locations. And so um, basically you can align these with wherever your fulfillment centers happen to be and then have separate campaigns for you know any areas where you might have customers but are further out. And so for your campaigns that are going to be really close to those uh, fulfillment centers, you can advertise you know whatever your standard shipping is there, um, whether it's next day or two day, um, you know you can use that to definitely punch up your copy a little bit. And if you have lower shipping costs closer to others, then that also gets more, uh, wiggle more aggressively in those locations as opposed to, you know, if your shipping cost goes up um, 5x because it's on the other side of the country from where you typically fulfill orders out of, uh, you probably don't want to spend as much on a click out there if conversion rates are consistent because that's still going to cost you more on the back end. And so kind of making sure that, um, you know, if, if shipping costs are um, uh, something that you pay close attention to, making sure that your campaigns are aligned by that can definitely help you balance costs a little bit more on the acquisition side. And uh, I think that's pretty much everything that we have. So I think we'll take questions for a few minutes. Awesome. Let's see. If you guys have any questions, go ahead and feel free to ask them now. We'll see which ones come through and then let's take it from there. I have a question for you guys. What's what's the first thing you guys look at when analyzing uh, a new campaign, especially or, or a new client, especially one that's spending, let's say, twenty five k a month or more, uh, from from an e commerce point of view? Yeah. So I mean, some of those things are going to be, um, you know, items, items we actually covered here. So if um, if someone comes in and they have a shopping campaign set up, if it's just one campaign, one ad group, all products. That tends to be an immediate red flag. Um, if we wanted to dig one layer deeper, something that we didn't necessarily mention today, um, I actually like to look specifically at performance for um, any individual products. And so if we see something that's kind of like the mob effect, um, if it's like basically one product is taking up a huge disproportionate amount of spend, has very low ROAS, um, I like to look at that. And um, also too, like sometimes, um, you do see like those big differences in conversion rate by device that we talked about. So that's a big one too. Nice. And, and I'm sure it depends on shopping cart and, and other elements of their tech stack, but are, are there any uh, tools or methods that you guys utilize so that you're kind of double checking the um, uh, data that Google and Facebook are providing you to really measure what is the impact of those ads? What's, what's the revenue that you're generating from these channels? Yeah, I, I see that as a big communication thing. Um, so like one example I can tell you about, um, just, you know, first just using surface level data from Google Analytics, um, I was having an in-person meeting with a client and I said, okay, cool, we have, you know, this is our revenue for the quarter. This is the return on ad spend that we're seeing. And uh, basically return on ad spend had increased by a pretty good amount, but they kind of gave me this blank look back. They were like, okay, cool, but what does that mean for our profits? And so um, after digging a little bit deeper, they kind of shared a few more um, a few more details about their profit margins. We dug into it a bit more. And from there, our conversations have been solely focused on profits. And so um, at that point, because Google Analytics is closely aligned with the data they get in their backend shopping cart, um, we're able to have those conversations pretty easily with margins factored in and um, kind of make sure everything's trending in the right direction. Awesome. Cool. Casey, there's a question for you here. Um, it says, what if I'm shipping my products over from China and I want to put, get them into multiple centers? Yeah, great question. So that happens often and uh, actually more often than not where people are kind of wondering, well, I'm just drop shipping from over in China and it's, it's not ideal because uh, it takes whatever, seven, 10, 14 days to get there and kind of comes in some kind of funky packaging. Um, but with, with this example, you know, you can ship it directly. Like, let's say you utilize a ship Bob or something similar. You can just ship it directly from, from the warehouse. And then we take care of all of that on, on your behalf. And 
depending on what you use, whether that be Shopify, BigCommerce, uh, WooCommerce, you know, it will it will sync directly with uh, your e-commerce platform. Cool, cool. Um, on on that note too, I have another one. It says, "What if we what if we put my inventory in one or two locations, but the buyers I attract changes over time and they do not live close?" Yeah, so this ties in really well with what Reese was talking about and and how you're uh, targeting geo targeting specific products to specific buyers, and we see this quite a bit. And so before people you know work with us, we uh, we get several months of, of shipping data from them and we'll take a look at which SKUs are selling in which locations and we'll utilize that as, as an input and, and recommendation to where they split their inventory. It's not a must have, but we do it for a reason and that's because you know the data is telling us a story and, and we're processing a lot of transactions and so we have some pretty good insight there, but but that's also something that learns over time. And so if if we start to see a shift in behavior uh, we definitely will will flag those and, and you can move your inventory. But again, whether you use ShipBob or, or something else, that's something you really should keep a close eye on because that uh, even if you're starting to have success at the top of funnel, if if your shipping time and, and your shipping costs continue to rise, you know, that can start to eat in your margins. Okay, cool. Um, question here from Philippe. It says, are you guys using the new Google Shopping Smart Campaign you know, versus the query level bidding strategy? What are your thoughts on that? Mm, yeah, that's a good question. Um, we have experimented with Smart Shopping Campaigns uh, across a, a pretty good number of accounts. And so the thing about Smart Shopping and really any other Smart Campaign or even Smart Bidding strategy, it's really only as smart as the data you feed it. By itself, it's kind of dumb. And so unless you have a huge volume of conversion data, I want to say Google um, requires at least 25 or 20 conversions in the past six weeks just to get that campaign off the ground. Um, and they recommend having um, 50 or more conversions in a month in order to be able to use smart shopping because basically all that conversion data is going to guide um, who the smart shopping ads are served to. And like one note about those is that Unlike regular shopping campaigns, smart shopping doesn't just exist on search. It's on display, it's on YouTube, it's basically on any Google-owned property. And so um, we have seen in a few cases where a smart shopping campaign will take off pretty aggressively in the beginning. And um, at first I was like, man, this is gonna change everything. And then a few weeks later, um, it just kind of peters out, ROAS starts to dwindle, fewer and fewer purchases happen. And this is even in accounts where you know, we're not just seeing 50 conversions per month, but um, this happened one that I can remember where there were 180 transactions per week happening. And after about a month, the smart shopping campaign ended up um, just kind of burning out. Um, for anyone who wants to run smart shopping campaigns, one other little um, note I'll throw in there is, uh, especially if you, have a, if you have a lot of revenue coming through shopping, um, don't just turn smart shopping on and wait to see what happens. Start off with a smaller subset of products because there is a good chance that the smart shopping might take over your existing traffic from your other shopping campaigns. Cool. And this, this question from uh, Christina that we have kind of plays into that too says, since shopping campaigns are not based on keywords, would you ever recommend creating different product feeds that include top of funnel versus bottom funnel search terms to capture more traffic? I feel like I, I don't know if I know the answer. I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to step on your feet here. Go, go ahead and answer that one, Reese. <laughs> um, uh, I would not recommend that. Um, I would recommend basically just having one feed that's as complete as possible. Um, and really, like if, if it's a matter of just where to allocate resources, start with the product title. Um, and in this case, it's because one, product titles aren't really a place where you want to include like any promotional or sales kind of copy you really do just want to describe the product specifically and accurately to make sure you're getting the right kind of traffic um, and also the the google merchant center doesn't really provide a very clean functionality for distinguishing between two different feeds um, normally there might be like one that takes over one set of products and another that takes over a different set so um, you know you can split test your product titles um, or make updates to them and kind of measure any changes in conversion rates on those specific products, but I wouldn't recommend two feeds. Cool. Um, and if you guys have asked if, if you guys relate to the actual recording, um, I just answered my own question. There is a recording. We will send it out as soon as this is done. You should get an automatic email from GoToWebinar. Um, there's another question here from um, Raj Deep. It says, 
do you have clients who are moving in e-commerce domain from traditional brick and mortar? What do you consider in those cases for e-commerce marketing strategies? I will like for, for myself, this is Jonathan here. Um, most of the clients that touch and, and find their way to us already have some sort of presence um, and usually have some little bit level of traction at the, at the minimum. Um, so it doesn't really change like our best practices from when we would start off. It's the same thing we do when we audit an account, even if they've been running, you know, on, on digital for years. Um, so there's not much that changes from what you've seen Reese go over today. Yeah. We asked that question again. It says, do you have clients who are moving into the e-commerce domain from traditional brick and mortar? What do you consider in those cases for e-commerce marketing strategies? Uh, okay, I see. I think I misheard it. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. I, uh, I don't think there's any more questions here. Um, and we are just timing wise at a perfect stop mark. Um, we'll send a follow up and recording for everybody here who's on the web. Thank you so much. Hello?